Hello everyone, welcome to the closing keynote of Spaces Summit Goes Digital. We really hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. And we have two more speakers coming up for you. Starting with the first one, we invited a special guest for you to take you through the world of quantum. So without much further ado, let me present to you Harry Boerman from CVE. Harry, take it away. Yes. Yes, we can. Very good. Yeah. So you bought your very first computer <laughs> online with bold.com. And um, after a few uh, weeks, it actually arrives and a big black box uh, like this one more or less arrives at your doorsteps and uh, you start to freak out a little bit because not only is it very big, it was also rather expensive and you bought this thing in the spur of the moment. It was cool, you thought, and uh, you, uh, you, you, you thought you would, uh, would need it. But then, of course, the first question that comes to mind now is, what on earth are you going to do with this beautiful black box that says quantum computer? And you frantically start to search the internet uh, for quantum programming and quantum applications. And the Wikipedia page uh, is there, but it actually is not very promising because it tells you that this quantum computer is programmed in a completely different way than your ordinary computer is. And moreover, it's not so clear what you can use it for. There are some examples, but actually a lot of stuff needs to happen. And actually, this question of buying a quantum computer in the, uh, on the internet uh, is, is not that far away as you might think, because already small systems like 10 or 50 qubits are available now. And we foresee that in the next five years or so, we will get about 50 to 100 uh, qubits that are available. And here you see a little graph. We, we actually expect somehow a Moore's law for qubits and quantum computers, and this is, uh, is, is, is indeed happening, and we see already an exponential uh, growth rate happening. And uh, to put this even more interesting uh, points uh, on, the, on the table here is that last year, end of last year, Google uh, um, came out with a beautiful paper in uh, Nature, which they called uh, Quantum Supremacy. And uh, what they did is they built, uh, they, they they're very rich, as you know, and they built uh, a quantum computer that consists out of uh, 53 qubits. And uh, what they did was they could sample from some distribution. Though it's not a very interesting problem that they solved. Nevertheless, they did sample from some distribution. And they actually also claimed that if you wanted to do this same thing on an ordinary computer, uh, even on a supercomputer, then you need uh, at least 10,000 years to um, establish the same thing. Then soon there, soon, uh, soon a little bit later, um, IBM uh, came with a, a claim a few days, days later. Um, you have to realize IBM is also in the business of making a, a quantum computer. And IBM said, well, uh, it is a, a beautiful result, but actually if you use our biggest supercomputer called the IBM Summit, which runs in 200 petaflops, then in two and a half days of computation, you can actually simulate and the, 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 the quantum computer and you can also sample from the same distribution. Now, of course, the interesting point to take away here is that 53 qubits on this quantum computer took a huge supercomputer, the biggest one actually that we have these days, two and a half days of calculations. And you can imagine that if you have a little bit larger uh, computer, say with not 53, but with 60 or 70 qubits, then it becomes completely impossible to simulate it on a supercomputer. And this claim of 10,000 years then actually holds. So let me dive into a little bit of the background because on all of this is the, uh, the, the ideas of quantum physics. And um, I'm gonna explain a little bit of uh, quantum physics. I'm gonna give you a course 101 in quantum physics that helps you understand how these, compu how these quantum computers work and moreover also how you, um, how you can program them. So let's start. And uh, you may have heard of quantum physics and uh, you may think it is something like quantum touch but that's not it maybe you've heard of quantum healing that's also not a thing maybe your favorite movie is quantum of solace again that's not what i'm talking about it's this old theory that started in the beginning of 1900s and here you see a bunch of people coming together at the famous conference in brussels and you see for example einstein and bohr and our own lawrence and curie 
and a lot of famous physicists that, that were coming there uh, together to talk about uh, the starting of quantum physics and the ideas that were put forward a few years before. And they were not at all happy uh, because quantum physics is a little bit counterintuitive. For example, Niels Bohr, who you saw also on the previous picture, said, if quantum physics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. And at the same time, Albert Einstein was fairly unhappy with the whole thing. And uh, he has uh, uh, has said that he, uh, he uttered the words, God does not play dice. And we will see in a minute why he said that. And Richard Feynman, another famous physicist, not yet in the picture, um, said, uh, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum physics. So what's this strange thing that is quantum physics? And I think there are three important principles that I would like to discuss with you today. And the first uh, principle is that of superposition. The second one is that of interference. And I will briefly say something about entanglement. And all these three are super important for quantum computing. So let's dive into superposition. Superposition is something very strange. And quantum mechanics says that a photon or an electron, but also larger systems, can be in different states at the same time. You may have heard of the famous example of Schrodinger's cat, who he put into a box. And then into that box, he put a vial with poison and a hammer that was attached to, to some piece of radioactive material. And when the material would decay, the hammer would hit the vial with poison and the cat would die. And now from a quantum mechanical description, if you don't look inside the box, you leave it closed, then the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. So it is in these two states at the same time. Now, how strange this may sound, this has been actually experimentally verified uh, many times. And as we speak, this is being verified with small systems such as photons and electrons, but also with bigger ones like molecules. And of course, quantum computers are the next step uh, in the system to be to be tested. Now, actually, there are many jokes about this cat of Schrodinger, for example, this one, which I particularly like about your cat, Mr. Schrodinger. I've got good and bad news. Anyhow, let's go back to our superposition and let me demonstrate this by somehow a simple experiment that uh, will figure also as a threat to, to my uh, presentation. So here I have a photon gun and that is a, a source of light that is so dim that only single photons come out. And you can think of single photons as little bullets. And this bullet here, I'm going to shine it at a little piece of glass called a beam splitter or a semi permeable piece of glass. And what will happen is that the photon will go through the glass and it will also reflect from it. And let's see what happens when I shoot it and I shoot it. It somehow goes according to quantum mechanics into a superposition of going through this piece of glass and reflecting. And this may be seen as this the scat of Schrodinger, which is dead and alive at the same time. Now you see that on both ends, I have put two detectors, two photo detectors that will click if a photon arrives there. Now what happens if a superposition arrives there, then actually only one of the two detectors will click and quantum mechanics says that is superposition now has collapsed into this state where the detector zero clicks. And actually when I repeat this experiment again, and we get the superposition again. Then if I do it exactly the same way, now the top detector clicks. And when I do it many, many times, you will see that 50% of the time one detector clicks and 50% of the time the other detector clicks. It's as if you threw a random coin that came up head or tails with equal probability. And this, by the way, is why Einstein said God does not play dice. He didn't like this, uh, this uh, phenomenon. Um, and actually, this, this phenomenon uh, has been uh, built and you can buy it. There is a, a little uh, company called Idee Quantique where you can buy a quantum random number generator, which works exactly along the principles that I just described. And you can plug it into your computer and you get a nice uh, interface. And here you see it. And then when you run it, you get a, a, a nice sequence of zeros and ones that are completely random according to the laws of quantum mechanics, according to the laws of nature. And of course, you may wonder, are they really random? And there's a nice Dilbert cartoon about that. 
um, which says indeed here we have our random number generator and imagine that this one would output all the time the same number in this case nine then you wouldn't really say it's random would you uh, nevertheless that is indeed a, a problem with randomness you cannot really verify that it's random but uh, nature predicts it's random and all the tests that we have done seem to con seem to indicate that it indeed is random so for the diehards uh, at uh, ball.com who have a little bit of mathematical background I, I want to dive in a little bit more and give you a mathematical description of what I just said. And uh, the way to, to look at this is that you have a qubit. So going through, we call zero and being reflected, we call one. And in quantum mechanics, you get this cat and bra notation, which are nothing else than just vectors in some vector space. And we have that we can have a superposition of these two states, namely alpha zero plus beta one. With the, prob with the property that these numbers alpha, beta are complex numbers, or if you like real numbers, if you don't like complex numbers, and if you square them and sum, sum them up, they have to be equal to one. So any state alpha zero plus beta one, where these alpha and beta satisfy this equation are valid qubit states. And the point is that when you measure this qubit, you will observe a zero with probability alpha squared, and you observe a one with probability beta squared. And now notice that it was good that we had that this alpha squared plus beta squared was one. Otherwise, this would not have been a nice probability. And our nice uh, device of Idee Quantique, that random number generator, looks something like this in this language. You create a superposition, an equal superposition of zero and one, with one over square root of two zero and with one over square root of two one. And now note that if you square these two, you get a half. And so you will see one with probability a half, or you will see a zero with probability half. And after you've measured the, the this state has gone to be a zero or to be a one, the state has changed, it has collapsed. Another strange feature of quantum mechanics. Okay, so that gives us item one, superposition of, of, uh, of uh, electrons and photons or objects they can be in different states at the same time and when you measure them when you observe them you will find that they collapse and you will find them in one of the states that they were in the superposition of now the second the second uh, part that i want to discuss with you is that of interference of a object in superposition and uh, let's dive in a little bit and uh, i i didn't hear any questions because you cannot ask them i think but um here is uh, this, this, this experiment uh, we just uh, talked about, and you could have objected that I was talking completely nonsense and that no way there was a superposition happening. This piece of glass was just made in such a way that sometimes by just a random effect, the photon would go through and sometimes this photon would deflect. And with probability half it would go through and with probability half it would reflect and never ever was there a superpositioning a superposition happening it could have been this it could have been this uh, this piece of glass and not this fancy superposition so let's make the experiment a little bit more complicated and let me introduce to you something that's called a mach zender interferometer and it looks the beginning like this, this experiment that we had before so i have here my photon gun and I have here again this little piece of glass that the photon can go through or it can reflect and then here on either side I have put mirrors and then here we have again the same piece of glass and I have two photon detectors here on either side of this of the second piece of glass here and let's see what happens if this indeed was a 50-50 beam splitter as, as it is, as if I'm reasoning in a classical way. So here I have my photon and I'm shooting it at the piece of glass. It goes with probability half up and it goes with probability half down. So let's now assume that we took the up path and we continue the photon and it comes here. And now what happens if I shoot this photon at this piece of glass again, we are in the same situation as we were before. And now the photon would go with probability half through and it would reflect and I would see a detector clicking pattern of detector one clicking with that probability half and detector zero clicking with probability half. And now let's do this experiment again and let's really do it. And what happens is that when I look at it, it turns out that detector zero always clicks and never is it the case that detector one clicks. So that's very strange, right? 
um, it, it, it really isn't uh, as, as, this, as this classical interpretation. And indeed, according to quantum mechanics, what happens is that you get into a superposition, then these two photons, they interfere here at this, at this place, at the second beam splitter, in such a way that you will only see a photon arriving at detector zero. So these, these paths are interfered in a positive way, and you will never see a, a photon arriving in detector one. So detector zero will always click in this case. So it really, this, this demonstrates that the world is quantum mechanical and that the superposition is happening and that it isn't, this classical interpretation doesn't hold anymore. Also for this, I have a classical uh, description and I will quickly go through it. Um, quantum mechanics says that uh, all the operations that you do are linear. We already saw that our systems were uh, vectors. And by the way, if people don't like this mathematical part, it's totally fine. I'm just putting it in as some background information for the people who like that. You will be able to follow the rest of the talk perfectly well without actually understanding the, the mathematical part. Anyhow, so quantum mechanics says that our evolution is a linear operator, which means it's just a matrix. And uh, quantum mechanics also says that quantum states have to be mapped to quantum states. This probability interpretation, this alpha squared plus beta squared is one, needs to be maintained um, when you apply an operation. And these two things together imply that we have something that's called a unitary operation or a unitary matrix. This basically means that the length of the vector is preserved, or you can also view it as you're rotating your vector around in its uh, space. And in mathematical terms, it means uh, very technically that if you have your matrix and you multiply it by the U star, or the physicists call it the U dagger, which is the complex conjugate transpose of the matrix, then you get the identity. An interesting thing you should take out of this is also that if you do this with, com if you do computation, and your computation has to be unitary, then it implies that your computation has to be reversible because this U star really is the inverse of U. And so that means that your computation can go forward, but you can also go backward. You can rewind your computation, which is not always the case for computations that we have uh, in real life. So you have to work actually to make them reversible. And here you actually see a famous um, matrix that is unitary. Here we see a Hadamard matrix, and here we see what is the complex conjugate of that matrix, complex, complex conjugate transpose. It actually is the same matrix, it turns out. And when you multiply them together, you see that you get the identity. So this really is a perfectly fine unitary quantum operation. And when we apply this to our quantum state, say a superposition of zero plus a superposition of one, and we multiply this Hadamard with this um, superposition, then we get the state zero. So we get the state that's zero, the, the, the quantum state zero. So no superposition anymore. So it means that one over square root of two zero plus one over square root of two one is mapped to zero. And, it's, and since it's, it's its own inverse, the zero maps, uh, the Hadamard maps the zero to the superposition. So this means that this piece of glass, this beam splitter or this semi-permeable piece of glass that I've been talking about in an experiment before, that's exactly um, uh, the same thing as this uh, Hadamard transform that I have here. You can do the same thing on a one, and when you do the calculations, you will see that the one is mapped to the zero minus one. So that's also an interesting state. Let me go on, explaining now the mach sender interferometer in this mathematical language, and this is just one slide. What really happens is that this, this photon is, is hit by a Hadamard transform, so the zero goes into a superposition of zero plus one. That's when they are in both these arms at the same time. And then it hits the second beam splitter, and again, a Hadamard is, uh, tra uh, transform is applied to it, and we are back into a zero, because the Hadamard times the Hadamard was an identity, it didn't do anything. Okay, so now you've seen that objects can interfere with themselves when they are in superposition. And now a third thing that I will briefly touch upon is that of entanglement. And here it is a little bit more complicated because we will need two um, physical systems uh, to play with. And I have drawn also that. Here you see a photon gun with a single photon 
uh, on one end, and here you see another photon gun with another photon on the other end. And now what I have in here is a little bit more complicated, so that's why I made it black, uh, than uh, a, a beam splitter that we that we saw before. So, but you can imagine that there's stuff inside here that uh, that also is like mirrors and uh, and uh, semi-permeable uh, pieces of glass and so on. And what now happens is when I shoot these two photons into this piece of um, uh, table with um, with mirrors and etc. Then these two photons come out and they are according to quantum mechanics entangled. And that means the following, when I now let these two photons go into uh, uh, a beam splitter again, each on their own side, then they are entangled. So they both go in superposition of going through and reflecting. But it now so happens that whenever detector one clicks on the on the right hand side also detector one clicks on the left hand side and when i do this many many times we will see that always the same detector clicks but the detectors will click with probability a half each but they will always be the same and this will also happen when these two photons are very far apart and so it, 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 it they are somehow intimately linked and uh, the the, in, the 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 probability that they go to one or the other is somehow it feels like immediately transmitted to the other photon, which is very far away. And this is very counterintuitive and it almost seems to imply that you can um, send information faster than the speed of light, which luckily is not the case. Anyhow, so these are the three principles that I wanted to tell you and um, superposition, interference and entanglement. And now let me tell you a little bit about quantum computers, because uh, that's when you just take these two things together, when you take quantum physics and computer science, which was developed by uh, Alan Turing, Alonzo Church and Emu Post. And when you put these two things together, you get uh, something that's called a quantum computer. And it took actually quite a time before people realized that it was uh, in the 80s when Feynman and uh, Deutsch uh, realized this and actually David Deutsch came up with a very nice uh, rigorous uh, formulation uh, of what a quantum computer is analogous to what Alan Turing did in the 30s. So 50 years later. Well we already saw that you can have uh, a qubit that's in the in the superposition of zero and one and now when you go to two qubits you actually get uh, something interesting. So a qubit can be in a superposition of these two classical states like this in mathematical formulation. And now when you have two qubits, then they can actually be in a superposition over four classical states. So it doubles and that looks something like this, where the amplitudes, the alpha zero, zero, alpha zero, one, and, and alpha one, zero, and alpha one, one, if you square them, they now have to sum up to one. And when you have an n qubit system, it can be in a superposition of two to the n classical states. So now imagine that your n is merely 300, so you have a 300 qubit system, then you can be in a superposition of two to the 300 different states at the same time. And you have to realize now that two to the 300 really is a tremendously big number that's bigger than the uh, number of molecules known uh, in the known universe. And this exponential uh, state that you can build, that's where quantum computing uh, gets its power from, or that's part of where quantum computer gets its power from. Um, and this exponential growth, people now also really realize uh, what it is because of Corona. Um, uh, you see that uh, we, we, now, now our population is um, en 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 engaging with exponential growth on a daily basis almost. But in quantum computer, that's actually a very good thing, and it gives you a, a, an exponential state space. And now when you want to compute your something with your quantum computer, when you want to calculate something with it, then it looks really, really wonderful because if I had only a 300 qubit computer, then I can do two to the 300 parallel computations at the same time. Well, that's really wonderful, and that means that you could, could really do a lot of computations for the price of one. But now comes the problem, and that is how on earth are you going to get the answer out? Because if you're going to observe this quantum computer, if you're going to try to get some answer out, then you destroy this beautiful superposition and you will only see one of these two to the 300 possible computations. And at that you will not even be able to control which one you see, you will see a random one. 
So that's not actually very useful. And so now it was good that we have this second feature that I told you about, this interference, because this is what a quantum programmer has to do. You have to somehow make uh, make an interference pattern happen so that these 200, 2 to the 300 computations, some of them will interfere with, the, with themselves positively and others will fear with, interfere with, the, with themselves in a negative way, very much like a noise cancelling headphones where you want to interfere the noise from outside with anti-noise so that you can really listen to the music that you have uh, on your uh, on your phones. Um, so a quantum programmer has to make this interference happening by means of programming the quantum computer. And the problem is that this is not always possible, uh, doesn't always work, uh, but we're actually trying to figure out and we're working on that, how, how you can do that and how you can actually tap into this extra power. I kind of think that quantum programming is like uh, composing, where a composer really has to interfere sound waves, sound waves in a specific way, such that he creates beautiful music. A quantum programmer has to interfere the superpositions of the qubits in such a way that they interfere such that they are doing interesting computations. So what does a quantum program now actually look like? Um, and actually we have a very primitive way still of uh, describing them. And uh, you have to go back on uh, how we program classical computers. And one way to do that is by describing so-called gates, a not gate, an end gate, and an or gate. And with these three gates, you can actually build any computation. And by the way, if you look into your computer, then actually this, these gates are really present at, at the chip level in, in terms of a transistor. Um, and they look something like this. And quantum mechanically, you actually have a similar set, but they're a little bit different. Uh, you have a control not gate, which is a two qubit gate, and you have a Hadamard gate, which I've actually already explained to you, and you have something else that's called the rotation gate. And with these three gates in your hand, if you put them together in the right order, you can do any quantum computation uh, that you like. Um, so that's actually a, a good thing to have. So you have this universal set of quantum operations. And so a quantum circuit, a quantum algorithm, typically looks something like this. You have an input and you have some extra qubits, some auxiliary qubits here, and then you have this Hadamard rotation and C0 gates, and they're sort of sprinkled all over the circuit. Time flows from left to right, and what happens is that at the end of the day, you measure, you observe this side of the circuit, which will result into zeros and ones here, and this is the output distribution that carries the answer to the computation that you want to perform with your quantum computer. Now this Google result that I told you about that worked on 53 qubits, so there are 53 qubits along this line, and what they did was they really put random, uh, a random pattern here in the circuit of 20, 20 layers deep, and then they measured what came out here. So it's a very uninteresting computation because just doing a random computation, but nevertheless, the output distribution is very hard to get classically. Here you see uh, some of the building progress, building qubit progress that uh, that is around. So we have a 50, 53 qubits of Google, but IBM also has a 50 qubit computer and Intel is not far behind. Then there are other types of qubits called trapped ions, and there's even qubits by D-Wave, uh, which is a company in Canada. And actually there are quite a few more companies these days and startups that are building qubits. But that's not the focus of this talk. I really want to focus more on software. And I noticed that the focus actually until uh, not so long ago, five or six years ago, was mainly on the hardware. And people were ignoring really the software side of, of things. Uh, what th th this question of what can you do with a quantum computer once you have it? And I think that applications are really essential for a su successful quantum future. And that's why I launched in 2015 a research center called QSoft um, with funding from the Center for Mathematics of Computer Science and Computer Science in Amsterdam and the University of Amsterdam. And we uh, launched QSoft. And two years later, uh, we got from the government a big gravitation grant, which are the biggest grants you can get in the Netherlands, to form what we call the Quantum Software Consortium, which is a consortium between Amsterdam, Delft and Leiden. And in Delft, you have to know that they actually are building qubits. 
Um, so uh, here you see a little scheme of what uh, QSoft is. We have a bunch of research lines, predominantly one and four, where we try to figure out what you can do with small quantum systems and what you can do with bigger quantum systems. That's respectively one and four. Then we have a line that deals with what, what can you still do safely once a quantum computer is there? Because I will say in the next slide, I will tell you that a quantum computer will break a lot of modern day cryptography. And we have a more blue sky research line called quantum information science. We have actually grown over the last five years to 20 permanent faculty. Uh, we have about 40 PhD students and 20 postdocs. And we range uh, computer science, physics and mathematics. And we also have engaged, engaged already with quite a few um, industrial partners, for example, with Bosch and with ABN Umbro. And we're doing projects uh, with them to figure out how a quantum computer can be useful for them. So, of course, what's on your mind, and uh, that's how I started this uh, this talk. What can you do with it, and um, what can I uh, what can I say? I can tell you a few things that that I know that you can do with it, and a lot of it is still unknown. So, one of the first things that was shown by Peter Shore in the in the nineties already was that with a big quantum computer, you can factor numbers, and when you factor numbers, you can actually break a lot of modern day cryptography. So. Um, your the bold.com should uh, take care here because the if I, if, I, if you buy something with bold.com then you can see this nice uh, lock in your browser that uh, tells you that you have a secure um, link with uh, with bold um, this this uh, protocol is actually broken by quantum computer so you have to replace it with something else luckily there is a quantum mechanical solution to this uh, by bennett brassar and eckert where they use quantum mechanics itself to um, come up with a safe, uh, a quantum safe solution. Um, another thing, and I worked myself in that, is that you can use quantum bits in a so-called quantum internet or quantum network, then you can make it quantum proof. But not only that, you can use this entanglement that I told you about to do certain uh, computations much more efficiently and also much more communication efficient. Then, Another application of a quantum computer is simulation of nature itself, because nature actually is also quantum mechanical. That's how we figured out that quantum mechanics exists. And for example, when you are figuring out how a, a chemistry reaction works, if you really look carefully, you see that it is quantum mechanical in nature. And with a quantum computer, uh, we can simulate these systems, whereas with a classical computer, it is uh, impossible to do. And a third type of uh, applications are that in optimization and machine learning. Uh, and I will say a little bit about that uh, soon, but these will have lots of applications in society and industry. So I hear this question also a lot, which problems have a quantum speed up and which don't? Can you give us a clear maybe property of a problem for when it is amenable to quantum speed up and when it isn't? And it, turns out that there is no easy answer to that. There is no easy criterion that tells you whether a, uh, a problem is uh, amenable to speed up or not. Um, I can tell you that there are roughly three categories of problems, namely those problems that allow for an exponential speed up like factoring and quantum chemistry. Then another type of problems is that where you have a modest speed up, a polynomial speed up, like for backtracking algorithms, search, algorithms or satisfiability solvers and then there's a glass of class of problems where there's no speed up these are either really really hard problems like counting the number of satisfiable assignments uh, to a formula or really really easy problems where it's so easy that you don't expect any uh, speed up anymore like for example searching searching uh, sorting sorry and a binary search and i have to stress though that for many problems we actually don't know yet in which of these three categories they fall. Let me give you one brief example of a quantum algorithm, and that's a, a, a walk algorithm. Imagine that you are uh, out drinking, that's not uh, no longer possible anymore, but it hopefully will soon be possible, and you're so drunk and you are in a strange city and you forgot where your hotel is. Now, one thing that you can do is you can do a random walk 
where you move randomly left and right uh, well, in, in the city. You at each crossing point, you randomly choose a direction and you go into that street. Now let's look at how that looks on, on the line where I start at zero and with probability a half, I move to the right and with probability half, I move to the left. And whenever I am at a certain point, I again move to the left and to the right with, with the same probability. So it looks something like this. And when you do that, you see this nice Gaussian distribution appear. So that tells you that here you see the number of steps that after this many steps, the probability distribution that you have moved over this line looks something like this. And you see that the highest probability is that you haven't moved at all, but you have moved a little bit to the left and to the right with some probability. Now let's do this in a quantum way and let's do this in superposition. So instead of moving either left or right, you actually go in superposition. And now this is what you get. So you actually move into a much faster way to the left and to the right than that you move here uh, in a classical way. So you get this nice distribution here on the right hand side. So let's look at that again. And here you see what happens is that when you do a classical walk, you move about square root of t steps away from where you started. Whereas when you do a quantum walk, you all actually move t steps away. That's beautiful. And another nice thing, and I was playing with this the other day, so I want to show you, is that you can also invert this. So you can move forward for 250 steps, and then you can just move backwards again. This is something you cannot do classically uh, in a random walk. You cannot go backwards, but quantum mechanically you can, and you end up exactly at the same point where you were before. And so now this quantum walk algorithms can be uh, can be used because you have to realize that a lot of algorithmic solutions can be cast as random walks on graphs classically. And now with a lot of extra work and a lot of thinking, you can use this idea to come up with quantum versions of these algorithms. And you can sometimes get a polynomial speed up and sometimes you can get even an exponential speed up. And here are a bunch of, of, of problems for which uh, this happens. For example, for satisfiability solvers, we get a, get a speed up. For backtrack algorithms, we get a speed up. Um, for matrix multiplication verification, you get a speed up. And there's many, many more examples of this. So this is a, a rich source of for us to build quantum algorithms. Not the only source, but it is a rich source. So another thing that uh, is important is quantum cryptography. And uh, this is probably also very important for Bohr. Um, you might say that, well, I'm not so worried about it because uh, we still have to wait maybe 10 to 15 years before we have a huge quantum computer that is able to factor and break our codes. But you have to realize that all information that is stored uh, um, is, is encrypted now can and will be intercepted and stored. And once you have a quantum computer, it will be uh, uh, one will be able to read it. So. If you want the information that you send out over the internet to be secure in the future, you already have to change your encryption now. And uh, there's a, there's a lot of stuff uh, happening in this in this field, cryptography in a quantum world, where we are using quantum mechanical uh, systems and we are using classical systems, um, and we're using combinations of the two. So let me uh, end by uh, saying what I think is needed. So at the moment we are looking at few qubits like 10 to 50 now and the 50 to 100 actually um, area has already, uh, we have already reached this and we are playing around and seeing what you can do with it. Notably, we want to come up with problems that outperform any classical computer and that are also actually somewhat useful. Uh, we are actually building small internets in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands also. There uh, is a, a, a network in the making between Delft, Amsterdam, Leiden and The Hague. And with that, we are going to hopefully build uh, entanglement over long distances. And um, we also have to verify these quantum systems. Um, I won't say much about this, but you have to realize that it is very difficult to actually verify that a quantum computer is a quantum computer. Then when we enter the realm of 100 qubits or more, we will be able to do something that's called error correction. And this means that you can make really stable qubits, which you then can use for nice computations, like for example, distributed computing, quantum learning theory and optimization will be able to take off then. 
and we will have industrial applications and use cases in the near future. Of course, we need to come up with new quantum algorithms and maybe new application areas. For example, maybe you can use these quantum computers to prove theorems that were not possible to be proven uh, now by, uh, by people and classical computers. Um, let me say a little bit, and I'm almost done because I'm uh, also uh, running out of time, I see. Um, so in the Netherlands, um, it recently we have uh, um, teamed up with all the main players in the Netherlands, and we have written something that we call the National Agenda for Quantum Technologies, or Quantum Delta NL. This was given to Mona Kaiser before actually the outbreak of Corona, uh, by uh, Robert Dijkgraaf, you can see him here on the right hand side. And um, what we're really building there is a quantum computing and simulation. We're building a national quantum network, quantum sensing applications, and, and of course applications that I have been talking about. So this on the national level, actually uh, money has been set aside, about 23 million to, to work on this. And uh, even more is in the, in the making, hopefully. Corona permitting. Then locally in Amsterdam, we are building a, a quantum hub that is there to do the translation of knowledge that uh, is, uh, is sitting on QSoft, QSoft towards industry and society. Um, maybe people will want to know more about that. They can uh, drop me a note or ask me a question. And um, then finally, this is somehow my grand view of how I think things should work. On the, on, the, on the left side here, you see what I call the hardware cycle, where mathematicians, computer science, theoretical physicists, and experimental physicists and engineers somehow work together and develop new algorithms and applications that actually run on actual hardware. hardware. That's one cycle that runs. Then there is a similar cycle, but that's the industry cycle where mathematicians, computer science, and software engineers all having knowledge from quantum uh, work on industrial applications and they do this together with the people at industry and also here we have to engage in a cycle and more importantly you should notice that these two cycles these wheels they don't spin at the same speed this one is spinning slower than this one and what's needed is they need to be geared together by some kind of gearbox and that's exactly why I see QSoft, Quantum Amsterdam and this Quantum Delta NL um, taking its role uh, apart from um, occupying these cycles, they also make sure that they actually work together well. So summing up, I think that uh, designing quantum software is super exciting. It really merges two great revolutions, namely that of quantum and of computer science. And there are really endless possibilities that lay ahead of us. And think of how classical software was in the 1960s. There is a famous quote of the boss of IBM then, TJ Watson, who said, I don't see a world market for more than five computers. And if you think now, then you probably don't even know how many computers you have in your home, uh, let alone how many there are in the world. And we cannot, work, we, we cannot even imagine our society anymore without computers then it's also quite urgent to work on this because medium-sized quantum computers will be there and the small ones are already there. And they really address uh, urgent social, societal needs like drug design and energy problems and not, not last but certainly not least security. And also in the Netherlands, and uh, we have actually a, a head start with, uh, with the rest of the world in some sense. We are unique in that we have this quantum delta with all these uh, groups ranging from experimental physics to computer science and chemistry, they all work together. And I think that this will, will enable us to come up with a quantum software and technology industry um, and that uh, that will be fueled in the Netherlands and in Europe. And that's where I want to stop now. OK, OK, thank you, uh, Harry, for this really excellent presentation, I think. Uh, there are a few questions in the Q&A and I will there, there are too many to go through, so I'll just ask you a few if you uh, like, and yes. then uh, we can. And I, uh, I, I don't see any anything, so I'll leave this. No, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them to you, and then you can just answer them. So uh, I think Very that good. works best. Um, so one of the questions people had was, uh, if this entanglement is happening, um, and it happens at a, at a certain distance, then why doesn't that mean that it is a faster than light information transfer? 
um, that, 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 yes, and, and the, the, it almost it, it seems that that, that 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 is going to happen. But when you mathematically uh, um, write out what happens, in, in, because there is this nice mathematical formalism, formalism called quantum mechanics, then you can actually prove that there is no information going from A to B. Although there are these strange correlations that happen, uh, like the, 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 the two photons, the, the detectors clicked at the, uh, the the same detectors clicked on on either side, so so you get correlations that that you cannot obtain without classically you could not obtain them without um, faster than light communication. Uh, nevertheless, you cannot abuse the system this entanglement to actually signal information from one side to the other side. So yeah, it's very frustrating. It it almost seems to give you faster than light communication, but it actually doesn't. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, one other question some people were asking is, uh, will there be a higher level programming languages for quantum computing or is it still a very mathy discipline? Would it remain so? Uh, there are already some programming languages out there. I think, uh, for example, Microsoft has built, built a programming language called Q Sharp. But really, in my mind, all, all these languages do is they have a nice way of of um, describing a circuit that I described in my talk, right? I mean, I, I showed you what the what the circuit was. Maybe I can actually go back to the to the to the to those slides. Let's see how can I do that. Um, um, and so, at the moment, we don't know really of a nice higher um, uh, order language uh, for for quantum computers. Ah, here you see it. So what they really do is they describe a circuit very much like this. Um, nevertheless, of course, there are all kinds of subroutines already available. So for example, there is a, probably a quantum walk uh, a part in there and another thing that is a quantum Fourier transform that for example, figures in this uh, algorithm of Peter Shore that breaks codes. And that's probably also a subroutine that is available. So there are libraries of, of subroutines available that you can chain together very much like, uh, like the classical uh, way of doing programming. But you have to realize that you really have to use this this strange interference way of programming things, and it, it's really you really program this thing in a fundamental different way. It, it it computes in a fundamental different way, fundamentally different way, and you have to actually program it also in a in a different way. So sometimes you have to to really turn your change change the way you think uh, uh, about things. Okay, I will. I will end with the last one. There, there are a couple more, but I think we are, are already a little bit over time. Um, Stein asks, when do you think quantum computing will be mainstream? Will it happen in our lifetimes? Uh, the, that depends on your definition of mainstream. Actually, I'm. I. I, I almost. All, almost we're already there. It seems. I mean, so many people are 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 working on on quantum computers these day, these days. And um, I think that uh, um, it will be mainstream. Um, not it will be mainstream in our, our in our lifetime. Actually, that's what I hope. And uh, uh, but I also think that it will be. Okay, thanks. So, that sounds really promising. Uh, I I really want to thank you for this great presentation. It's you're very uh, it's very excellent. Uh, also from the Q&A section, it appears that a lot of people found it very interesting. There were also some people who said, well, I don't follow all this mathematical stuff, um, but I guess you already mentioned that it's for the people who find it interesting and, and not everybody. So uh, yeah, but I think from the comments, it's really clear that a lot of people attended. There are 156 people were on average in the, in the, in the talk, so that's quite high. Very nice. So, uh, thank you very much. Yes, and um, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, send me, drop me a note.